Amen. They could sing that one every week. I love that one. Uh, and it's fun to sing too, but boy, what a great worship song, right? Just to um, praise Him for who He is and what He means in our life. And so thank you, choir, uh, for sharing that with us this morning. I'm glad you're here this morning and have come to worship with us. I see a few empty seats. Uh, that's to be expected, I think, on Labor Day weekend. A lot of folks are kind of getting that last little traveling in. Uh, before we're kind of buckled in for a while. Um, But we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, Thank you for participating in our worship time. Some great old songs, some that aren't even in the hymn book anymore, uh, kind of reminding us of who our Lord is uh, to us. And so we're glad you're here to worship Him. If you're visiting with us, I want you to just relax and feel at home. Uh, This is a sweet group of people you're worshiping with this morning. They welcome you, and they just want you to feel uh, a place here this morning to just let God speak to your heart And uh, there's never any pressure in this place. Uh, We just want the Holy Spirit to move uh, and speak to people's lives. So we're glad you're here. want you to feel welcome uh, this morning and just to feel free um, to worship with us um, as we open his word together. And so I want to lead us in a word of prayer this morning one more time before we open the book. And let's just ask him to prepare our hearts, uh, to give us eyes to see this morning, ears to hear uh, what he wants to say to us through his word today. So would you pray with me if you would? Father, we are blessed um, to get to be in this place this morning. And God, already, um, God, we've been blessed by the study of your word in our Bible study time this morning. We thank you for that. Uh, Thank you for our very capable teachers who have prayed this week and prepared and this morning just poured their heart out as they taught your word. And thank you for each person who received that and heard it. And God, now as we enter into this time of worship, God, we declare before you this morning that you are worthy, worthy, worthy of our worship. And God, I thank you for these great old hymns and songs and spiritual songs that we have lifted to you this morning that just remind us of who you are. And God, I pray, Lord, that now as we enter into a time in this service when we're going to open your book together, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come And God would cause your word to come alive to us today. God, I believe that this book is a gift from you. Inspired, inerrant, infallible word. And God, we can open it daily and read it and look at it. And God, unless your Holy Spirit takes it and speaks it to our heart, we're going to miss it. And God, I pray that even now with our heads bowed before you, our eyes closed, God, that our heart would be God, speak to me. God, let me hear you this morning. God, not that honorary guy standing in the preacher and in the pulpit, God, not not just because of what church we're in today or, or where we are, but God, let us hear from you. Let us hear you speak through your truth today. And we, God, pray that, Lord, you would empower your word today that as it goes out, Lord, just like it says about itself, it would not return void. God, there may be some folks in this room that just need a word of comfort and help and strength in their life. God, I believe you can speak that into every life. God, there may be some in this place today that are concerned about things going on in our world that are uptight and filled with worry and anxiety 
God, at the things they see happening around them. And God, I know that your word can speak into that. And God, you can bring a peace that passes all understanding, just like your word says. And we pray for that. God, I also believe, Father, that your word transforms. It changes hearts and lives. God, that your word has the message of your hope and salvation in it. And some this morning in this place may need to hear that. God, I pray your Holy Spirit would speak a word of salvation and hope and life into that life. God, this morning, God, we just pray, God, that you would take the next few minutes. You'd help us to shut everything else out of our hearts and mind and just focus on you and what you want to say to us. And God, you be magnified and glorified in this place today. When we leave this place, may we leave here rejoicing, not because of what church we attended today, not because of the name on the door, God, not because of what style of music or any of those other things, God. Those are all way down the line in in lines of importance. May we leave here this morning rejoicing in you because we heard from you. We encountered you. And we were changed by your truth today to your glory. Holy Spirit, fill this place and have your perfect way to your glory. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen. All right, take your Bible this morning, if you have your copy of the Scripture with you, and be finding the Gospel of John. Um, We're going to be in John, the eighth chapter. As a matter of fact, we're going to be in the Gospel of John for the next several weeks. And so uh, you might want to just stick a marker in there, kind of mark it. I would even encourage you to... um, Start reading through the Gospel of John. Uh, Go home today, maybe start reading. It won't take you very long. Uh, Many times we encourage folks, you know, with books of the Bible and things like that that we think can be a great help to you. Uh, And wherever you are in your walk, maybe you consider yourself to be a relatively new believer or maybe you've been a Christian for a really long time, I would point you to the Gospel of John. It's a wonderful word about who Jesus is, who he came to be. And so we're going to be in the Gospel of John for about seven weeks. And so I want you, if you would, um, to just take it, start reading it, start pouring over it. There's some marvelous teaching in the Gospel of John where he helps to reveal to us who he is. For example, you'll find seven miracles in the Gospel of John. Each one of those are a part of Jesus revealing to us who he is and who he wants to be in our life. And so we're going to be in the Gospel of John for several weeks, kind of pouring into it. And I um, want you to kind of be finding that with me, if you would, this morning. We're going to be in the eighth chapter today, um, so I'm not skipping seven chapters. You know I'm not going to do that, right? Um, but we're going to be in the eighth chapter today, so go ahead and be finding that, if you would. You know, in Jesus' lifetime, during his time here on earth, there came a point in his life when his disciples had walked with him for a really long time, and it seemed like um, they just weren't getting it. They just weren't figuring out exactly who Jesus was. One minute it seemed seemed like the light bulb had come on, and the next minute it would seem like they totally didn't get it. And so at one point in Jesus' ministry, he came to them and he said to them, you can read this question in Matthew 16, 13, he said to them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do men say that I am? And they staggered a bit and stumbled a bit and began to try to answer the question. They said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say that you are Elijah or one of the other prophets. But then Jesus personalized the question, and I want to personalize the question for you this morning for just a second. Because after he'd asked them, who do men say that I am? Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? Who do you believe that I am? And, and he asked his disciples that question, and that's where we get that great declaration from Peter, um, where he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? Makes that great bold statement. Well, let me ask you this morning, who do you say that he is? H- who is Jesus to you? And that's a very important question if you've never asked yourself that question Who is Jesus to me? I I don't want you to hear me so much asking you that question, but I think Scripture's relevant for us today. So I want you to hear Jesus, just like he asked his disciples, asking you, who do men say that I am? I'm going to tell you who men say that he is today in just a moment. But he asked that question, and then he said, who do you say? So let's let's hear him asking us that question today. Who do you say that he is, really? And maybe by how we live our lives... 
And by the kind of faith that we have, even in the circumstances that we live in in our day, maybe even if we look at our lives, how we might answer that question and what our life really shows that how we live that question could be two different things. Who do you really say that Jesus is? Now, now, now think of that for just a minute as we continue along here because I just believe that the truth of the matter is that could not be a more important question for you to ask yourself and try to answer. How you answer that question, I'm telling you, will determine where you spend eternity. How you answer that question has a lot to do with how you navigate and live every single day in our world, even today. Who is Jesus to you? There's a lot of world leaders, famed personalities, those even from the past, some of these names might even surprise you that I'm gonna share with you, had a lot of different statements to say about who Jesus was. Mahatma Gandhi, who was not a Christian, right? Mahatma Gandhi said that Jesus to me is the great world teacher among others. Acknowledged him as a great teacher. The Dalai Lama says, Jesus is a universal teacher, a person of integrity with natural authority. Old Winston Churchill, right? Top hat, chewing on a cigar. He said, Jesus is an inspired prophet, an exceptional teacher, and an exemplary role model, but not the Son of God. Oh yeah, right? This is one that might surprise you. Mark Twain said, the best teacher ever lived was Jesus Christ. But then he went on to say, if Christ were here, one thing he would not be is a Christian. Wow. This one might even get a few more gasps. Adolf Hitler said, Jesus was a great fighter, and he called him his Lord and Savior. Wow. A lot of people can say a lot of things about Jesus, right? But really, who is he in our life? Who are we letting be in our life? Has he changed us? Has he made any difference in us? Mikhail Gorbachev, one time religious leader, said, and I think this is interesting, Jesus was the first socialist. And Vincent van Gogh, the great preacher, the great painter, right? Impressionist, who cut off his ear. That's what we know about him, right? Did you know Vincent van Gogh at one time wanted to be a preacher? Interesting, right? He said Jesus was the great artist. Of course he did, right? The greatest artist who ever lived. Napoleon Bonaparte said Jesus is more than a man. Bono says, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and if we could be more like him, the world would be transformed. That's a pretty good statement. But Albert Einstein, right? Scientific leader, great inventor, who called himself an agnostic and a religious non-believer. That's what he called himself. I like what he said about Jesus. He said, Jesus is a luminous figure. The full quote is this, I'm a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful. No myth is filled with such life. That was Albert Einstein. So I read that, and I could go on and on, just looking at what different world leaders, many of them, most of those had no connection to Christianity, didn't profess to be Christians. A few of them did, but most of them did not. They had an opinion of Jesus. What's your opinion of Jesus? Who do you say that he is? Who is he to you, really? Now, to me, that, there couldn't be a more consequential question than that. I think Jesus didn't really hide who he was. He reveals himself to us. He wants us to know who he is. We don't have to be grasping at straws out here in, on earth today trying to figure out who is Jesus. He tells us right here. We can see it. And we either believe it or we don't. And some of the claims that Jesus makes about himself are pretty fantastic if you really want to go, really want to know. And in John's gospel, Jesus, in more than any other place in scripture, specifically says, this is who I am. Okay, And so if we want to know him, really know him, 
And I believe it's important for us to really know and understand him. If there's this question in the back of your mind, well, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not really sure who he is. I'm not really sure that all the claims he made about himself are true. Maybe that's you this morning. I want you to just hang in through a series of messages that I want to just kind of call, who does Jesus say that he is? Who does he say that he is? And my prayer for this, that if you're a Christian and have been a, long, a Christian for a long time in your life, I think we need to get to know Jesus better. Because the closer we get to Jesus, the more like him we are, the more impact we're going to have on our homes, on our families, on our culture, on our society. We need to know Jesus. If there's one thing a person who professes to be a Christian is, it is that I know Jesus. I know who he is. I know who he claimed to be. And this is what I've done with his claims. And that's what we're going to get into um, in this passage of Scripture. Now, you go, well, why is this going to take seven weeks in the Gospel of John? Well, if I was preaching verse by verse through the Gospel of John, be thankful I'm not, it would take you about three or four years to get through that with me. You know that. Oh, I can make one verse last an hour. You guys know that, right? So, so it could be that. So what I want to do is I just want to look at the claims of Jesus from the Gospel of John. Who did Jesus say that he is? And I want you to get to know Jesus in a whole new way, because I believe that's life-changing. I mean, it's life-changing for me, just working on these messages. I got to tell you, I'm seeing things, discovering things, realizing things I never saw before. And you know what it's causing me to do? It's causing my faith to just come alive, a new passion, a new desire, a new quest to really know Jesus. Philip Yancey years ago asked the question in one of his books, what's so amazing about grace? I want to know what's so amazing about Jesus. Well, you're going to find that out over the next few weeks. And so I want you to stay with me. Now, in the Gospel of John, you're going to find that Jesus is constantly saying, I am this. He doesn't mince words about who he is. When he asks us, who do you say that I am? Well, he tells us who he is. He doesn't mince words. And there's at least seven of those statements in Scripture where he says, this is who I am. This is me. Now, we call those, some people call those, the great I am statements of Jesus. And we're going to look at those. We're going to look at all these statements where he tells us who he is. But before we do that and get into John, i got to give you some background and some text for this, right? So think about this just a little bit. Um, the New Testament is one thing where we're looking at who Jesus is, but he's going to make some claims we're going to hear him that are going to even kind of harken back to the Old Testament. So I want you to think about this. Before we ask who Jesus is, who is God? Remember in the book of Exodus, God's people had been in the bondage of slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years, and they began to cry out to God, and that cry came up to God, and God sent them a deliverer. But the way all of that came about was very fantastic. He appeared in a burning bush to a man by the name of Moses. Remember the story? And God said to Moses, I want you to go to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses kind of stuttered and stammered and said, oh, now wait, God, right? I don't speak well. They don't exactly like me back there, right? And who am I supposed to say sent me when I go? And Jesus, for the first time in Exodus, revealed his name. And it's an interesting name that he gives from the burning bush. It's the name I am. Say that I am has sent you, right? Say, I am has sent you, right? You get that? So, so that's the name that God gives to Moses from the burning bush. When you go to Pharaoh and they say, what God sent you? Say, I am sent you, right? And, and so but that's an English translation of the Hebrew. Now, a little bit of background here. The Hebrew language is very, very interesting, right? Our Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew. New Testament primarily written in Greek. Well, the Hebrew language is complicated, right? All consonants, no vowels. Think about reading that. All consonants, no vowels. So how do, how do I even pronounce this, right? And it doesn't read like we read, right? To us, it reads backwards. Not from left to right, but from right to left. So if you take a Hebrew book and you begin in the front, you're beginning at the back. It begins at the back and reads the other way. So you go, well, who in the world could understand that? A Jew, right? A Hebrew. And, and so when, when God gave him that name, literally this is what the name was in Hebrew, if you look at it. It was the letters Y-H-W-H. -H. That's the Hebrew name 
I am. And that's also called the proper name of God. So sacred was this name that a good Jew never pronounces it. They never say this word. Now it was written down, but when scribes or early teachers wrote this word down, they used a writing utensil that had never been used before, and they wrote the name, and then they destroyed the writing utensil, burned it. It could be used, what's considered so sacred was this name. That's how holy this name was. Hundreds of years later, scribes came along and they added vowels to this consonant-only language. And that name became the name that we know now, Yahweh. That's how it was pronounced, Yahweh. And you hear that word and you go, what does the word Yahweh mean? It means I am. I am the God that is. I am the God that was. I am the God that always will be. I am the God that will be whatever you need me to be, right? I can be for you. I can deliver you. I can save you. I can sustain you, right? I'm a God who will be present in your life, whatever you go. I'm that God who will never leave you or forsake you. That's who God said he was when he said, I am. That's who I am. Now, that makes the statements that we're going to hear in these next seven weeks even more spectacular. Because Jesus is going to tell us who he is, and every time he's going to say, I am this. Now, who is he calling himself just by even using that name? I am God. I am God among you. Remember, when Jesus was born, not too far from now we'll be celebrating, there was a big deal about what to name Jesus. The first name that Joseph was given was you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. But that wasn't the only name. The second name he gave them was Emmanuel. Remember what Emmanuel means? God with us. Who is Jesus? I am the God who is. I'm the God who was. I'm the God that will always be. I am God with you. Folks, that's a powerful, intoxicating statement. Now, what are you going to do with it, right? Who do we say that he is? Is he really God or is he not? That's powerful. Now, we're going to look at an interesting passage of Scripture, one that at times has been a bit controversial in John chapter 8, in the first 12 verses there, and I want you to hear this statement from Jesus. When we ask the question, who does Jesus say that he is, you're going to hear him say it. You ready? Here we go. Not only is this a great story, but he makes this de great declaration about who he is. But I want you to think about that question all through this story. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to the religious leaders you're going to encounter in the story? Who is Jesus to the woman caught in sin? And let me just tell you, where were you when Jesus found you? Caught in sin. Who is Jesus to you, right? Who is Jesus in all of this? And then at the end of this passage in verse 12, he's going to tell us who he is. Look at it, beginning in verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery, the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her. Now, let me just stop there for a minute. If we ask ourselves, who are we? We're in that verse. We're with sin, right? We're in that verse. If I said, who are we? We are sinners. Maybe saved by grace, but one thing every single person in this room from the pulpit to the very back row has today is that we're sinners, right? Right? We can't be throwing stones. Why? We got sins of our own, right? We make poor stone throwers. I mean, they can pick them up and throw them right back. We're in the same boat. Verse 8. Again, Jesus stooped down and wrote in the ground. After saying, 
He goes, without sin, throw the, throw the first stone. Verse 9, verse 9. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning from the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Who did Jesus say that he was? He's the light of the world. Now, we sang the songs today, right? The light of the world is Jesus. And we sing the song, I saw the light, I saw the light, right? And when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, I'm afraid that we trivialize that statement. We say, oh, that's nice. He's the, I saw the light, right? And we have a tendency to take that word about who Jesus said he was, and we make it a fairy tale, a simple childhood story about Jesus being a light. And we sing the little sign, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? That light is Jesus, right? And we kind of trivialize this, that, that statement just a little bit. But I want you to understand that when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, that was a controversial subject. And in this story, he'd already gotten himself into trouble, right, by whatever he wrote on the ground, which we don't know, but I have an indication, kind of an idea here, that he may have written the sins of some of those men who were wanting to stone her. That's a possibility, right? They were trying to trap him. They didn't like his response. He did not follow the law of Moses, according to him, and stone her. He said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. He's already gotten him in self-trouble. And then in verse 12, he essentially used the name I am, which says what? I'm God, the creator of light and all things light. You get it? You think he got himself in a little hot water there in the temple? I would think so. Listen, don't take light of this statement where Jesus says, I am light. What's he telling us here? Well, think about light with me just for a second. Light is essential to life. It is. We need light. Um, even in the darkest places of the earth, listen, God has created those creatures that dwell in utter darkness at the bottom of the sea or in the deepest recesses of caves with the ability to have light. That's interesting. They produce it within themselves often. I want to share with you some amazing things about light that I discovered this week just when I was working on this sermon. And these are just about 10 fantastic things. I'll try to go through them pretty quickly, but I want you to think about the miracle of light. Remember, God's the one who said, let there be light. And Jesus now is saying, I am the light. I I'm the light of the world. All of these things I'm going to share with you, I want you to know that creator God is behind it all. All right? So first of all, listen to this. The most efficient light in the world, you know what it is? The light of a firefly. That's amazing. All of the things that we do to generate light aren't as efficient as you think they are. But the light in the simple tail end of a firefly is 100% efficient. That is amazing. Scientists don't even have an answer for that. But it's the most efficient light in the world. Did you know that humans, we ourselves, emit light? That we actually give off light ourselves? Remember, the Bible says we were created in the image of God, right? I mean, it is a thousand times below our ability to see it or detect it with the naked human eye. But when we walk around every single day, there's a part of us that strobes like a light constantly. Most people don't even know it. Scientists have now been able to create some images that they're able to actually see the light coming from human beings. Did you know that, and I know this personally because it's me, that light can make you sneeze? I promise you when I walk out of here in a little bit and open that door, the first thing I'm going to have to do is cover my nose because I'm fixing to sneeze. It gets me like that. But listen to me. You know why it makes you sneeze? Because you're a little bit brain damaged. It's true. So now you know you have a pastor that's just a little bit, a little bit brain damaged. 
So, so this is what I kind of discovered in kind of getting to this one. The human mind is a wonderful, complex, glorious thing, but even sometimes it mistakes the messages that are sent to it. If you sneeze in the light, you're not alone. One third of the population sneezes in the light. And what happens is your brain triggers that response to sneeze and it gets it confused with the response it's sending for your pupils to dilate to protect them from the sunlight. And that's interesting. That's what happens. So that's why scientists say, eh, one third of the population is just a little bit brain damaged here if you sneeze in the light, guilty as charged. This one's even better. Did you know that the daylight that you see today was generated 100,000 years ago? When you woke up this morning and saw the first dawn of light, that was generated 100,000 years ago. That, that's amazing, isn't it, of how God is. Now, that light begins as photons in the center of the sun, and it takes it 100,000 years to get to the surface. And once it gets to the surface of the sun, you know how long it takes to get here? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. That, that's amazing, that kind of light. And listen, God created all of that. It works like a better than a fine old machine. That's him. Did you know that every object on earth produces light? That's interesting. And that the majority of wildlife can glow in the dark. The majority, 90% of wildlife can glow in the dark. That's amazing. I've already said this one just a little bit, but it takes about eight minutes for light to get from the sun to here, but it takes only a minute, 0.25, 1.25 seconds for it to travel from earth to the moon. That's how quick the light travels. That's amazing. This one I found amazing. Did you know that peacocks, most beautiful birds you've ever seen, bright colors, I mean, do you know peacocks are actually brown? They're actually brown. When you look at them, you are seeing a miracle that happens in your brain when you look at them. There are tiny microscopic particles on a, the feathers of a peacock that cause it to do things to our eyes that interfere with the light, causing those feathers to appear in all the bright colors you see. But if you could really see them the way they are in reality, they're brown. Hard to believe. Light does that. Did you know that in England, our dear English friend back there, maybe you knew this, that in England they have a right to light. Now we talked today about the right to life, right? But in England they have a right to light. If you've lived in a place for 20 years and you have natural light coming through your windows, no one can build near your house in such a way to impede with the light coming into your home. You can keep them from the, according to English law. That's interesting. I don't know if you knew that or not, Diane, but that's amazing. So someone comes along, and like we do here in Texas, where we build right up close to each other in houses, you could say, uh-uh, English law says you can't do that. <laughs> I got to get my light, right? And that, that, that's amazing. And then this is, this is one that I just had to kind of throw in here as the 10th one. When you say, I'll be there in a jiffy, or when Buddy says, this sermon will be empty and it will be finished in a jiffy, right? Do you know what that is? That's actually a light measurement. It is one trillionth of a second. That's a jiffy. So when I say I'll be done in a jiffy, don't believe it. Isn't going to happen, right? And if you make that bold declaration, I'll be done in a jiffy, it's not true, right? You're not doing anything in one trillionth of a second. All right, it's a light measurement. So that's, those are just some fun things about light. But, but just think about the miracle of light. Th think about that. Think about how for generations when the earth was first created, there was darkness. They, they didn't have the kind of light we had where you flip a switch and it comes on. Daytime was their light. Nighttime was dark, right? And when fire came along, that created a whole new realm of them being able to see at night with something of a light. And when we read about light, really the, the, the declaration in Scripture that we read about light doesn't have to do with electricity. It has to do with firelight. It has to do with fire, with a light. Now, we associate fire with all kinds of things. Passion, right? Passion that burns within us. Passionate fire. 
that passion can consume, but, pa- but fire can also light our way. It's an amazing thing when you think about it. You and I need light to live. And the light of life is Jesus. You see, the truth of the matter is we once walked in darkness, but now we walk in the marvelous light of who he is. He who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what Paul, how Paul said it in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For you, Christian, were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. It's a call to us, all right? And you and I are to be light. And so when Jesus makes that great declaration in, J- in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life in him. He was making a powerful declaration. Now, I just want you to think about this. I've asked the question already, who does Jesus say he is? And here at this passage, I'm the light of the world. What does that mean for us today? How do I apply that to my life? What's he teaching us? What's he, what's he saying to us there? And so this message today is just about that declaration he makes. When we ask, who does he say he is? He says, I'm the light of the world. And I just want to give you two points here for you to get from this passage of scripture we're looking at in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 12, especially focusing on verse 12. Just two quick points here. Jot these things down. And here's what he's saying when he says, I'm the light of the world. First of all, I want you to understand that Jesus is making a claim here that we have to receive seriously. He is making a very serious claim here. I'm going to say this. You're going to hear me say it again in just a minute. He is either who he claims to be or he's not. Who is Jesus to you? He told us, do we believe it? And this is a claim he's making that we've got to receive with all seriousness. We've got to seriously do something with this claim. Now, now look at it carefully again and notice what he says there. Then Jesus said to them, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light everlasting. That was a astounding statement for him to make, especially given the context for what's happening. Now, a little bit of a Bible study. If you've got your Bible open there, hopefully you do. In John chapter six, just want you to kind of look at the context here of what's taking place. Where did he say this? Where did this take place? Well, we already know from chapter eight that he's in the temple teaching. Remember what it says on up there in verse two? The early morning, he came again into the temple and he began to teach the people, right? So he's in the temple. But Jesus has actually been in the temple now for several days probably. If you back all the way up to chapter 7, it's very interesting. He, he, he comes and he makes the statement in the middle of something big going on at the temple. And, and this is significant for him to make this statement. The temple as the site in Jerusalem where any of the great feasts that were celebrated by the Jewish people, there was a pilgrimage of people to come there. And Jesus has come into Jerusalem to the temple for a feast that's taking place during this time. And this feast was very important. If you think about this, there were several different feasts that were celebrated um, by the Jewish people, at least three major feasts. One of those was called the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's what's taking place in chapter 7. Maybe you've heard it called the Feast of Sukkot. That's what the Hebrews would call it. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. That feast, along with the Feast of Pentecost, and that was another one of the significant feasts of that day. The the, the Feast of Pentecost was one of them. And so another one was the Passover, the three important feasts that they celebrate. Well, at this time in chapter 7, chapter 8, they're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, what is the Feast of Tabernacles? During the Feast of Tabernacles, they would come into Jerusalem, into the temple area, and it was a feast that was to celebrate the wilderness wanderings of the people when they lived in tents in the wilderness. It, God provided shelter for them. And during the wilderness wanderings, they would live in tents. So at the Feast of Tabernacles, they would come into the outer temple areas around Jerusalem. They would live under tents for a period of time to celebrate God's deliverance of them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt, where God said, I am. That's interesting. So there's a context here, right? And during the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a celebration that started on the first night of the Feast of Tabernacles that was very commemorative. And I'll get to that here in just a minute. But all kinds of things are taking place here. So if you want to understand what's going on here, let's kind of remember kind of some things that were happening. 
The, the setting here is the temple in Jerusalem. More precisely, it was in this temple treasury room in the court of women where all of these tents had been built and they're going to celebrate. And clearly, the, the treasury, the court of women, would be a busy place. It was the busiest place around the temple. And I'm going to show you some pictures of the temple here in a minute and you'll see this outer court that's just huge. And that's where all these people were. That's where this incident takes place, where they bring the woman to Jesus. She couldn't go into the inner courts. She could only come into that area of the temple because she was a woman, okay? And so we know that's where he was when this took place. On the evening of the first day of the feast, the Feast of Tabernacle or Booths, there was this tremendous ceremony that they called the illumination of the temple. And it commemorated a part of what happened during the wilderness wanderings, just like the tent that was set up. In Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 through 22, the Bible tells us, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. It was with them when they left Egypt, and it stayed with them through the entire 40 years of wilderness wandering. They had this pillar to glide them by day and a light to guide them by night. God provided that according to Exodus chapter 13. Later, in the book of Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 9, 19, Nehemiah is encouraging and reminding God's people of his provision for them, and he would remind them of this. And he said, yet in your manifold mercies, God, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. So the very first day of this typical, this feast of the tabernacles, right, where they would build these houses, they had what was called the illumination of the temple. And during this time, they would light huge torches in the temple so that at night, all of the temple mount and throughout Jerusalem, the town would, it would glow. This is a picture of what this festival of tabernacle during the celebration of illumination took place. That was to commemorate God's great light that guided the children of Israel in the wilderness. The second picture is pretty amazing. You can see this. Now, if you were to go to the Holy Land today and you were to begin to drive up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem sits up on top of a hill. They called it the city of light, right? Because when this happened, the whole top of that mountain glowed with an amazing light reminding them of God's provision and who he is. Now let's put that in the context of what Jesus just told us, who he is. I'm that light. I'm the light you're commemorating. I am, God's proper name, the light of the world. Not just for Israel. I'm the, I'm the light. I'm, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light that gives you hope. I'm the light that you follow. They would have heard this in God and, and some of the priests would have torn their robes. That They would have said, this is sacrilegious. This is a claim we cannot put up. You wonder why did they follow him around trying to trap him? Why did they want to get rid of Jesus? Because he was making these fantastic claims about who he was. Now you got to do something with that claim. He's either who he said he was or he's not. And if he is who he said he is, it is absolutely imperative that you and I get hold of who Jesus is, right? If he's who he claimed he is, we should follow him as Lord. We should follow him as God. That's the claim he made. And if you believe this book, Jesus just said, I am the light of the world. I'm God. I am the light that's come to give light to all men. That, that, that's a powerful statement in its own right. I can just imagine many of them said, come on. Are you telling me you're God? And, 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 and I can just imagine that many of those religious leaders would have run from that place screaming, thinking this is sacrilege for him to make that claim. And I'm going to tell you that Jesus is either he claimed to be or he's a liar. Or worse, he's deceived, right? right? He's a lunatic, right? Or he who he said he is. And if he is who he said he is, we should adjust our life to him. We ought to live surrendered to him. We ought to give ourselves to him if he is who he claimed he is. And if he's not who he claimed he is, get rid of this book. He's who he claimed to be. 
And we're going to hear him make these claims over and over again in Scripture. And here's the claim. This is why I say, listen, this is a claim we've got to receive seriously. He is God. We must worship him as God, holy God. We must give our lives to him as the hope of our salvation. It's more than just a trite saying when he says, I am the light of the world. Barna recently did a poll of Americans and asked them, what do Americans believe about Jesus? Interesting poll, interesting question. It's what we're talking about here. just want to read a part of this article because I found it interesting, and it went so perfectly with what we're talking about today. According to the Barna Research Group in this article, who do Americans believe that Jesus, what do they believe about Jesus, right? And you know, they're polling all kinds of Americans all across this nation, trying to find out religious beliefs, and here's what they said. Jesus Christ remains a central figure and continuing person of interest in the American religious landscape. But what do Americans believe about Jesus? Who do they say he is? The vast majority of Americans believe Jesus was a real person. But people are much less confident in the divinity of Jesus. About one quarter say Jesus was only a religious or spiritual leader like Muhammad or Buddha. Folks, I'm telling you that when Jesus said who he was, and that's the question we have, who do you say that he is? Well, who did Jesus say he was? He said, I'm the light. The same one who called light out of darkness and created light. All those fantastic statements we read, those 10 facts about light that just amaze us, right? All of those things. The very light that we saw this morning when we got up, Jesus said, I'm the God of all of that. That's me. That's what he said at the temple. At a moment when it would not have caught them off guard, they knew exactly what was going on on that temple mount that day. And when Jesus said, I am the light, he said, I'm God. I am God in your presence. I am the long-awaited Messiah. I am the hope of the nations. I'm the God of salvation. I'm the God that created everything out of nothing by mere spoken word. I'm that God. Now, the truth of the matter is he's either claimed to be or he's not. C.S. Lewis wrote a great little book, hard to read, but many of you may have read it, called Mere Christianity. And there's a lengthy quote that he gives here, and I want to read it, guys. I know I'm taking a long time here, but I, I want you to get this first message in this series because it's important for us to ask the question, who does Jesus say he is, and what are we going to do with that? What are we going to do with it? I want to know Jesus, right? What does that mean? It means I want to know God. I want to know who God reveals himself to be in Christ, right? Here's what C.S. Lewis said, and I think this is interesting. Listen close. I'll try to read this statement slowly so you get what he's saying here. I think this is important. He says, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's interesting. And so C.S. Lewis goes on to say this. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of someone who said that he was a poached egg, right? Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come away with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. God's either, Jesus is either who he claimed to be or he's not. And we've got to take that claim seriously. John MacArthur said it like this. He said, liar, lunatic, or Lord. Those are the only options to consider when it comes to determining the truth about Christ. And the great Scottish preacher, John Duncan, said, Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud, or he was himself deluded and self-deceived, or he was divine. There's no getting out of this trilemma. Do you get it? Now, folks, I'm telling you, that's a serious claim. And this morning, right here in this place, we need to ask ourselves, who did Jesus say that he was? He said, I'm God. I, I, I am the light of the world. I, I'm the light that lit the way for the children of Israel from the burning bush when I said, I am. I 
and the God that is and the God that was and the God that always will be. I am the light that led the children of Israel through all of their wilderness wanderings and brought them safely to the promised land. I am that God. I'm the God that called light out of darkness and created it. That's me. Now, what are you going to do with that? Well, that's the second point, and it's the one I want to close with in just a jiffy, right? <laughs> I really don't have but a jiffy, so you're going to have to get as close as we can, all right? So think about it. That claim Jesus made is a claim we're going to take seriously, but here's the second thing I want you to see. Jesus' invitation in that statement is an invitation that we have to respond to personally. We've got to do something with the claim because he does give an invitation here. And I want you to see it. Look at verse 12 again, this passage where he says this. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. And here it is. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The invitation is to follow him. What did the children of Israel do in the wilderness when the light that guided them by night, the pillar by day, what did they do when it moved? They followed it every time. If it moved in the middle of the night, they followed. If it went to the left, they went to the left. If it went to the right, they went to the right. And that wasn't evil with that many thousands of people following. But any time the light moved, they moved. They made a conscious decision to follow the light that had given them hope. And you and I must daily make a conscious decision. Either Jesus is who we claim to be or not. And if you're going to embrace the claim of Jesus, then what is our option? What is our invitation? To follow him to follow him. Wherever he leads, I'll go, right? Wherever he wants me to go, I'll go. Now realize this. There's a cost to following Jesus. A part of that cost to us is walking away from the darkness and walking into the light with him. You see, one of the things that happens to us when we get closer to Jesus and the light begins to shine on our life is we get real uncomfortable. If God's spirit begins to break out in the service in an invitation time, in a response time, you know what happens to us, right? We get real nervous. We start hanging onto the pew and like, what do I need to do with this? And maybe we feel some conviction and like our toes are getting stuck. People say that to me all the time. I'm like, I'm not stepping on your toes. That's the Holy Spirit doing that, right? What is that? Oh, God just turned on the light. That's what happened. And when darkness gets exposed to light, it doesn't like it. Turn on a light sometime in your garage and watch all the little creature, creature, creatures scurry away from the light, right? And know that you're one of those little creatures when he turns his light on. And the choice is he's made a great declaration. I'm the light. That's a claim we've got to take seriously. But the second part of that, short second point, right, is what am I going to do with the claim? I can scurry away from the light or I can follow the light. That's up to you and me today. Our choice has to be to follow the light. He's either who he claimed to be or he's not. And if he's who he claimed to be, our choice is to follow him. That's a great declaration. When Jesus said, I'm the light of your world, I want you to recognize that light heals. Light restores. Light mends. Light doesn't just expose, it does expose. But what it exposes it heals. And that's Jesus. He is a God who is, who was, who always will be. And he can be the answer to whatever ails you in your life. He's the hope. Would you bow with me forward to prayer? With heads bowed and eyes closed, Lewis is going to just begin to play our song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look at the light. Go to the light. Right? Jesus. He said, I'm the light of the world. And folks, I'm telling you, listen, personal question today, who is Jesus to you? Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Is that who he is in your life? Have you made the conscious decision to personally follow him? Let me say, well, I've got lots of questions. That's okay, so do I. And you're not alone in this room. We all do. I hope over the next few weeks we clear some of those questions up when we look at who Jesus claimed to be. And I've given you a big chunk to chew on today, right? Jesus made a fantastic claim. I am God. And either we're going to follow him as God and Lord of our life or we're not. The choice is up to you. 
So right now, with heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody's looking around, just between you and him, we're not going to put you on the spot or embarrass you in this place today. Have you made him Lord, God, Master of your life? Have you invited him in? Have you committed yourself to him? Have you taken the first step in following him? You can do that right where you're sitting, just between you and him. You can even say to him, God, I don't understand everything there is to know about the Bible or about you or even all this church stuff, all this religion stuff. I don't know. But I'm hearing you make some fantastic claims about yourself from the Gospel of John. You are saying, I'm the light of the world. You're professing yourself to be God. Show me. We just begin to pray that. Show me. Show me who you are. I can promise you that if you pray that prayer, he'll begin to show you, if you'll be open to it. This morning, if you're a Christian, listen. Take this claim seriously. Are you really letting him be master, Lord, God of your life? Who's in charge? Who's calling the shots? Make a conscious decision today to follow the light. If you're here this morning and you need to come, you need to respond in some way. We're not even going to sing the song because you know it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You know the words. It's an invitation. We're just going to pray. We're going to let Lewis play for a moment. Trey's here. I'll be here. If you want to pray with one of us, you come. Make that pew, that seat, your altar today. Will you let him be who he claims to be in your life? You come. It's Lewis Place.